conectado desde la sala de videoconferencia de la Facultad de Económicas de la UNED con eh, Daniel Ganser, historiador suizo y profesor de la Universidad de Basilea y autor del libro Los ejércitos secretos de la OTAN, la operación Gladio y el terrorismo en Europa Occidental. Y por eso le entrevistamos hoy aquí, para saber qué fue la operación Gladio y cómo se desarrolló en nuestro país, ya que el libro contiene un capítulo dedicado al mismo. I'm going to ask you a group of questions. Uh, the, mm, the first are going to be about Gladio in general, mm -hmm. and the history and so on. And then I want to talk about Gladio in Spain, about your chapter mm -hmm. of Gladio in Spain. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk first about the general things about Gladio in Europe. And so what is uh, Gladio? What's the def definition of Gladio? And what, what are the secret armies of the NATO? So the word Gladio is actually used um, as a name for the Italian secret army, which operated in Italy during the Cold War. Um, Gladio was discovered in 1990, uh, first time in Italy, and then uh, Italian members of the secret army said that similar secret armies existed in all countries of Western Europe. The Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti at the time explained that uh, the name Gladio was secret for a long time, nobody knew about it, um, and it, it was the name for a stay behind army, which meant it was a, a network of soldiers. Uh, who waited for a Soviet invasion, that was one of the main uh, ideas. Uh, and the other thing was that they tried to manipulate the Italian uh, political system in the absence of a Soviet invasion. I would like to know if it was uh, financed by the CIA or uncoordinated by uh, NATO. Uh, where did the money came from? Well, the idea for the network uh, was uh, an American and a British idea. Washington and London at the beginning of the Cold War were scared that in Western Europe, communist parties or at some times socialist parties would come to power. And in Italy, we had very strong communist parties. And in France, we also had strong communist parties. And so um, they set up these networks. And so the money in the beginning came from the CIA, the American Central Intelligence Agency, which is the Foreign Secret Service of the US. And much of the training came from the British, the MI6, uh, the British Foreign Secret Service. So really, it was the CIA and the MI6 together working in Italy um, and instructing um, the secret soldiers of the Gladio units. The coordination of the stay behind armies was managed uh, through NATO. So we had a secret branch within NATO, which was called the Allied Clandestine Committee, ACC. And in this ACC, the rep representatives of the Gladio in Italy, people from the CIA, people from the MI6, but also from all the other NATO countries, that's from Norway or Denmark or France or Germany, they met and sat together to discuss uh, what to do with the secret armies. So, um, how did the secret soldiers receive orders? Uh, there were hier hierarchical direct orders or there was freedom of action? There was a hier hierarchical structure because um, in Italy, for instance, you have the defense ministry and within the defense ministry you have the military secret service. And within the military secret service there was a sub-branch which is that Gladio branch. So it was really integrated um, as a secret element within the uh, military secret service. It was not part of the army. It was part of the military secret service, but in the sense that people who were working in these networks, they, didn't con they were private people. They didn't consider themselves to be um, working for the state. Um, some, and that is the delicate thing, were from the extreme right-wing groups like uh, Avanguardia Nazionale or uh, Ordine Nuovo. These people in Italy were fascists convinced that they had to fight communism because um, they um, thought the communists are atheists and they hated the atheists very much. They were devout Catholics and, and they didn't want that the communists uh, come into power. So these people were supported by uh, the United States and by Great Britain in order to keep that delicate balance of power in Italy and in other countries um, in such a way that uh, the left would not gain too much influence. 
So you mean that there, they were, um, there were two different uh, kind of uh, Gladio soldiers, like uh, two, two groups of uh, Gladio soldiers, like uh, the ones that were prepared to act in a, possible, uh, in a possible USSR invasion, and others that were terrorist, fascist. That, that is very, that is the delicate thing, you know, that is really the most complicated question to answer. It is true. All of these secret soldiers say, we just waited um, for the Soviet invasion. That is not a criminal thing to do. I mean, these people just thought, in case Italy or France or Germany or Switzerland or Greece, in case any of these countries is, is going to be occupied, okay, um, then um, we got come into action. We don't do anything if there's no invasion. So that is a, a first group, that is correct. But then there's another group, and, and that is also correct, which um, was more interested to fight the political fight in the country. Um, there is a, a general, an Italian general, who commanded the Gladio network in the 1970s, and his name is Gerardo Serravalle. And he explains in a book um, that when the CIA came um, to the training center, they had a training center uh, on an island off the Italian coast, um, and, and the gladiators were trained there. And then, then when the CIA came, the general Zeravalle explained to the CIA, you know, we have arms caches we, in hidden places, so in case of the Soviet invasion, we're ready and everything. And then he explains that the CIA was not so interested in, in their preparations for a Soviet invasion. They were much more interested, he says, in what they can do um, to influence the Italian political system. So in case there were large, large um, you know, um, uh, protest movements, would they could break a protest movement or would they could carry out um, destabilization operations. And that is, that is a very delicate thing with the NATO secret armies because we now know that some members of the Italian right wing, um, they came forward and they said, yes, um, this secret network existed and yes, um, I knew of it and I cooperated with it and I carried out terrorist attacks. Um, it, which, would, which were then blamed on, on, on the communists or, or, or on, the, on, the, uh, on the other groups on the left. And this helped to destabilize Italy. Vincenzo Vinciguerra is, is, is there the most important source. He then went to jail. But in jail he explained, you know, NATO covered us. We, were, we could carry out terrorist attacks in Italy. And then we were flown, some of us, to Spain during the uh, Franco dictatorship. That was a safe haven. And then we were flown to another country. So it's a very delicate thing. For example, after I will ask you about the, the Italian uh, fascist terrorists that came to Spain. But for example, uh, Ali Akka, Akka uh, the, Ali pers Atlanta. the person that tried to kill uh, John Paul II. Uh, yeah. I think you, in your book, in your chapter about Turkey, you talk also about his organization. Was he? Uh, Both, yeah. Can we can we say that he was also a stay behind soldier? In Turkey, we have um, also a group of people who belong to the Grey Wolves, which was uh, a very nationalist um, and sometimes militant part of of of, uh, of Turkish establishment. And these people, some of them, worked in the stay behind networks. But it is very difficult to say. This person, um, we know for sure, was a member of the Turkish secret army. And this person is just a freelance terrorist. I mean, that is very difficult to say because we don't mm -hmm. have the lists of all the people who worked in the secret armies. The military secret services only confirmed, yes, we had secret armies. Yes, they were equipped with explosives. Yes, they were equipped with weapons. Yes, they were trained by the CIA. Yes, they were trained by MI6. Yes, they were linked to NATO and NATO was in command. But whenever we try as historians to talk to NATO and tell them we need documents, were these people involved in terrorism? When we try to talk to the CIA and say we need more documents, were you linked to, to acts of terrorism in Europe? I mean, then the CIA says we're not going to comment. And NATO says the same thing, we're not going to comment. Because it is still today on you know, unspeakable almost to say that there was CIA-linked terrorism in Europe. So it is, it is ongoing research. We know that acts of terrorism were carried out, and we know that many people, including in Turkey and in Italy, who were involved in these acts of terrorism, say 
the Americans and the British covered us. They wanted us to carry out these, these acts of terrorism, but it's very difficult to prove. I'm very interested in the, um, in the economic part of, of Gladio. I know there is not more, much information, but um, for example, in Italy, does it, um, the, the Gladio uh, network did, um, had something to do with the, the Vatican Bank, the IOR, and the uh, Ambrosiano, and, and so on, and, and the money of the Mafia? This I don't know for sure. It is, it, it is unclear how the money flows were organized. What we do know is that in one case, the Italian secret soldiers, the gladiators in Italy, um, they said, well, you know, the Americans, they give us the weapons for free. Um, and the British, if we buy the weapons from the British, then we have to pay. Um, and then there was a debate within the defense ministry in Italy whether they should take the weapons from the Americans, from the CIA, or from the British, from the MI6. And um, then the military uh, professional said, well, it's actually better to work together with the British because they have a better training. And what they did in the end is that they went to the British, took the training from the British, and at the same time took the weapons from the CIA for free. And in fact, when the British found out, they were very angry because, you know, they wanted to sell their weapons as well. Now, the whole structure of um, financial flows into Italy during the Cold War is very complicated. Banco Ambrosiano, many other uh, structures, they, they had um, black money throwing through their accounts. And um, whether some of this black money was used to support the secret armies is possible, but we don't know. Have you studied the links between some uh, Gladio soldiers or, or, pe or people like uh, Lithio Gelli or uh, Reinhard Gellen, the Nazi, uh, with the Order of Malta? Is there, uh, have you studied that or is there any more links? What I looked at is, is um, like people like Lizio Gelli. Um, I looked at these people in more detail. Lizio Gelli was um, obviously a right-wing extremist in the Italian Cold War, and he was convinced um, that the Cold War was a war. You know, he didn't consider it to be peacetime. He thought we are at war with the Italian communists. And so um, he was actually uh, paid a lot of money by the United States um, to make sure that the influence of the Italian right-wing groups were strong in Italy. And Gelli made this statement that, you know, thanks to Gladio, Italy didn't become a, a zone of communist influence. So he was proud and he said, we had a lot of influence behind the scenes, obviously in in public, people would say Italy is a sovereign country and is a democratic country. But he says that was not true. We were neither democratic nor sovereign because we had a parallel structure, um, in this case, the Propaganda Due, which was a network of people who were from the parliament, who were from the executive, who were leading industrialists, who were bankers, and who also were judges or police officers or military officers. And they all cooperated behind the scenes, behind the scenes. And um, that is not the idea of, of democratic checks and balances. In a democracy, you actually have the parliament which controls the executive. Okay? And if something goes wrong, you have the judge who says, you know, it's not all right. But in Italy, with the Propaganda Due and with Gladio, we had parallel structures who, who operated behind the lines. And Lizio Gelli was always invited um, um, to the United States when a new president uh, came into office, such when in 1981 Ronald Reagan became the new president of the United States. Lizio Gelli was there. He was invited because he was an important person from, from, from the globe. Um, and the same in Germany. If, if, you, if, you, if you look at Reinhard Gehlen, which, whom you mentioned, he was a general who, who worked for Hitler during the Second World War. And many people think that at the end of the Second World War, um, all the generals who worked for Hitler went to the Nuremberg trials. You know, they went directly to jail. And that's not true. Some did, but others were flown to Washington because they were useful. Okay, the Counterintelligence Corps, which is an American uh, secret service, they recruited some of, of the Nazis and said, now, why don't you run secret operations for us in Germany. You are useful. And Reinhard Gehlen, um, he was the chief of Fremde Heere Ost. Uh, he was then the first commander of the first German 
Secret Service, which was called Op Organisation Gehlen. That's quite embarrassing, you know, that uh, actually a general from Hitler was the first commander of, of, uh, of the first uh, German Secret Service. Uh, but under these circumstances, the stay behind armies and the secret structures could be set up also in Germany. When I say Germany, I mean obviously the, the part controlled by, by Washington and not the part uh, controlled by Moscow. And um, do you think they really feared a, a USSR invasion? Or, um, or what did they fear the most? The Soviet dictatorship? Or that their multinational companies could not have access to cheap labor salaries, for example? I mean, uh, because maybe it was, uh, I think it was an excuse, uh, the, the USSR invasion, because as you said, uh, they didn't want the, the communist parties to, to be in power. But um, also, not just the communist parties, but also the working class movement, I think. Because um, why um, did they fear so much the USSR? And by the other way, they were uh, going to China. Nixon was going to China, and China was also a, a, a communist dictatorship. So I, I don't understand that very well. Well, this is a question which comes up many times for historians. If you look at the Cold War, you can ask, why was the CIA fighting the, the communists? Why was the MI6 fighting the communists? So what was the problem? And obviously one side of the problem was um, uh, that people hate the communists. They thought they have totalitarian structures. There was no voting right, for instance, in Romania and Bulgaria. You know, there was just the communist party. You could not vote. Uh, you could not, you know, meet where you wanted. You had secret services coming and arrest you. Under Stalin, for instance, uh, the Soviet Union was a totalitarian system. So some people in the CIA and some people in MI6, they were especially worried about these things. And that's why they said, we fought for freedom in the sense of we fought for, the, for a good thing. We tried to liberate people from communist oppression. Now, that is one story, and it's true. But there is another story, which is also true. In some countries, we had democratically elected presidents, like in Chile, for instance. We had Salvador Allende. Uh, he was democratically elected, and he tried you know, to, to give more money to the people in Chile um, and to become more independent of the United States. Now, he was overthrown in 1973 by the CIA, and Pinochet was installed, who was a brutal dictator. So people go like, we thought you fight against dictators. We thought you fight against, you know, um, uh, the oppression of people. But in this case, you actually installed the dictator. Why did you do that? I mean, it doesn't make sense if it really is true that you fight uh, for freedom. And then you see that the CIA, um, in some cases, is not interested in fighting for freedom at all, but is interested in securing um, actually um, economic privileges. Uh, that's what you say, you know, you say, well, what is it if we think about the money? What is it? Is it actually the money? Why they do all these things, you know, that this big companies have bigger profits? And and there is obviously a lot of examples. In, in Guatemala, for instance, you, you had United Fruit Company, if you want the concrete example of a company, and United Fruit Company, today called Chiquita, they produced bananas and other um, uh, fruit in, in Guatemala. And they produced, produced this very cheaply. And, uh, and the farmers, they were exploited. They, they belonged to big haciendas and they, they had no rights, okay? They had no salary or just very, very small salary. And, and, uh, and then a new government came in, Arbenz, Jacobo Arbenz. And he said, now let's, let's change this economic structure. It is not fair and it is not right. We should give every farmer a bit of land so he can have a little income. You know, just a very little income. He could not get rich. It would just be a little bit for him and his family. Um, but that obviously meant that the big companies would lose their, 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 um, their big land. And that was not acceptable. So the CIA came in and, and they overthrew uh, the, go the government of Guatemala in 1954. Obviously, that was against democracy, but it was for uh, international companies. And now the question comes, how about Europe? Was that the same? It is obviously something which applied also to Europe. Um, uh, Americans and the British were scared that the labor movement would, would be very strong. 
and that labor um, unions, as you had them in France and as you had them in Italy and also in Belgium, um, would actually, um, you know, dominate the whole uh, economic discourse. In the end, Europe uh, was much more lucky than Latin America because uh, uh, we managed, most countries managed, uh, to have good salaries for their people, to have social welfare plans. I mean, all these things that we have today in Europe, they, you know, they, people fought for them. Uh, voting rights for women, uh, free of, uh, freedom of press, you know, this obviously <laughs> with limitations. But um, so it is true what you say, this fight for, for money is always part of the picture. Yes, because uh, maybe that's the only... Um uh, the only information that I will I would like to to have more maybe in, in your next book about Gladio you can, you can study this because it can seem strange that the U.S. government was fighting against the Nazis uh, in the Second World War, World War but after uh, they were hiring some of them uh, like Klaus Barbie and and Escorzeni or Reinhard Gehlen and they were protecting them and hiring hiring them for their own interests. So this makes me think that uh, we should not uh, think so much in terms of nations, but of uh, oligarchic power of uh, some multinational companies. Because uh, as I said before, uh, there's no problem with China right now, and it's a dictatorship. So the, the problem is not the dictatorship, uh, but the problem is that mm, the thing is that if you can invest or not, or not in that country, if uh, it's a dictatorship, uh, but it lets you um, have your companies there and you can have your uh, yeah your companies in that country, there's no problem. But if the, if it's a dictatorship that doesn't want the, um, the, those companies to be there, then there is a problem, and then you have to change. They have to change the government. I, I don't know if I'm wrong. But no, but I, this is obviously something which many people are interested in. You know, it's the debate about the free market. Basically, what people say is the free market means everybody can invest everywhere on, in, in the world, and uh, you know, the best products will be then generated, and everybody everywhere in the world will get um, richer and will have a better life. That is the theory. Okay, but obviously we see that in reality, it very often is the case that some countries are poor and they have a lot of debts and they just have to pay interest on their debts all the time. Their people don't have any education, they can't go to school, they can't even read and they have no chance to get, you know, build a strong middle class. And you just have a very, very small um, oligarchy, uh, as you called it, and that is the correct term. It just means that you have an upper class of millionaires, for instance in Angola if you want. Angola is an interesting country, they have a lot of oil, it's all offshore. But Angola has a millionaire class. These people are very, very rich. They rule the country. They used to be communists, but you know it doesn't matter. They now became very rich. And the rest of the country is very poor. And what you say is correct, that as long as it's possible to invest in these countries, the government can stay in place. But um, to take a, a new example, if you take the Iraq war, which started in 2003, I mean, Saddam Hussein obviously was a dictator, and he was a brutal dictator. He tortured his people, um, he, he used uh, 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 weapons of mass destruction, he really used them against his people. Later he didn't have them anymore, but um, he, he, was, he was an evil dictator. Only, he was supported. He was supported by Washington, he was supported by European governments during the 1980s. Now, in the 90s, they changed their mind. And in 2003, they overthrew him and said, we are now for democracy. Democracy is important. And that is always the story we hear. We always get the story, we only do this for democracy. We don't do it for profit. We do it for democracy. And here in Europe, we just love to believe that because it sounds good and it sounds ethical and it sounds correct. But if you look at the details, you see that now in Iraq, um, the uh, oil is being, you know, opened up to foreign investments, like ExxonMobil can invest, Chevron can invest, Stott Oil can invest, BP can invest, Shell can invest, also Chinese and, and Malaysian companies, Petronas, they can invest, and they're actually buying part of that oil. They couldn't do that when Saddam Hussein was still in power. So it is true what you say, we always have to look at the money flow, we have to look what is the interest of nature 
in Europe and during the Cold War the interest was in many ways also to protect the investments. That is true. Now I'm going to ask you some questions about Spain, about your chapter of Spain. Um, maybe we can begin uh, in the civil war or, uh, or if you want to make a, a brief introduction of Gladio in Spain, I don't know. But maybe um, I would like to ask you what's the background of, uh, for Gladio in Spain after the civil war? I mean, the, the case of Spain was very um, special because Spain was a dictatorship under Franco. And in a dictatorship, you don't need to manipulate uh, the elections or you don't need to you know, fight the communists. I mean, Franco uh, was making sure that there were no communists in the, Italian, uh, in the, in the Spanish government. So that was a completely different situation uh, uh, compared to, to France or Germany or Italy. Um, the question is, what was then the function of Spain? Were there secret armies in Spain as well during the, during the Franco dictatorship? And there we actually have the same problem. We see, yes, there were secret armies, but then Franco and his system, he had so many different units that he could use um, for illegal operations, he didn't actually need a secret army. So the interesting thing uh, is actually coming in the 1970s when Franco dies, and uh, Spain enters NATO in 1982. That's, that's you know, when you really look at Spain in this transition from a dictatorship to a democracy. And there it is interesting to see how does that very young democracy look at that very difficult chapter of the secret armies. And there we just found out that the military secret service, I think it was, it's called CESID, I'm not sure whether I pronounce it con correctly, but the military secret service of Spain during its time as a democracy continues to run these secret armies. And when in 1990 the secret armies are being discovered in Italy, um, Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti, Prime Minister of Italy, says, you know, these secret armies existed also in Spain and in France and in Germany and, and in Belgium. And the governments in, in, in these other countries are very, very, very embarrassed because they didn't want to talk about it. And some people in, in the Spanish parliament, now that is very good, you know, when you have a democracy, you have people in parliament who ask questions. You didn't have that during the Franco years. But then in 1990, you have people in the Spanish parliament who ask questions and say, we need more information about these secret armies. The problem was only that Defense Minister Serra at the time in Spain said, no, we're not going to talk about this and uh, we don't know much about it anyway. And and all in all, it was not very strong performance. I mean, the democracy was probably too weak. They, 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 there's no knowledge about the Spanish secret army in the, in the Spanish parliament. I was very surprised to, to read in your, in your book that there was a um, Gladio base in the Canary Islands, in Maspalomas. Um, uh, what said Alberto Bolo, uh, a secret soldier, uh, about the Las Palmas base? Mm, the Las Palmas base the, is in that way similar to other bases in, in Italy that it was an island. You know, when you have the mainland and you have the islands, it is very easy to have something hidden or secret on an island. I mean, it is the same thing in Italy. They, they had the Centro Adestramento Guastatori, which was CAG, which was the center of the gladiators in Italy, it was on an island. And in Italy and in other countries, the idea was that these islands could also be used to put political prisoners there. So, you know, they served as a twofold thing, as a training camp for the secret armies. But in case of emergency, so we have some sources who say these islands would have been used as prisons. And what about Escorceni, the Nazi? He, he lived in Spain until he died. Was he related to, to Gladio structures? It is very hard to say what his exactly role was, the role of Scorzani, but we have different right-wing extremists who just move in these networks. I mean, that was one of the questions that, as a historian, I was very surprised to find that we have so many right-wing extremists in the secret armies of NATO. Um, as you correctly said, at the end of the Second World War, the idea was we have defeated fascism, we have defeated right-wing extremism, 
and we don't want right-wing extremists in, in, in secret armies. Why would we give them explosives and arms and training and fly them around with, with the help of the secret service? You know, that is something which is completely unthinkable. Um, in some countries, like Norway, um, we had people who were just um, people from the center. They were not extremists in any way. I mean, I talked to, to different secret soldiers in Norway, and they were mainly preoccupied that Norway had been uh, occupied so quickly during the Second World War by the Germans. And they said, we need a second option. We need a secret army. Not much understanding for that, you know, that some people said, we want a guerrilla, a secret army, but we don't do any terrorism and we are not right-wing extremists, nothing. I also have talked to people in Switzerland, and most people I looked at, uh, they are not, they're not right-wing extremists. But some that is important. Some are. Some were right wing extremists, and Scorzini was one of them. And these people, they said, we are in a war anyway. So if we carry out a terrorist attack in Europe, that's okay because we are at war. There was a um, Gladio person, Belgian, uh, Andre Moyen. I don't know if uh, you you have uh, yeah, yes I, I cannot pronounce it very well. Um, who was this man and and what's his, what's his role in in a Spanish gladio? You know, it's not very clear the role of André Moyen, but this, some people um, say he was working for the Spanish uh, for the uh, Belgian military secret service and he set up networks also in Spain. And some other people say, oh no, he never worked for the secret service at all. But uh, what, I, what I just collected in my book are all these statements that we have about uh, the stay behind armies mm -hmm. in Spain. And what we know from different sources is, yes, there was a secret army in Spain. Yes, it was linked to CIA, MI6 and NATO. And yes, we need more investigation into this. Now, the, the statements of the, of the people that I mentioned in my chapter on Spain are not the full story. We would actually need much more information, but we only get this information if mm -hmm. the Spanish parliament asks for um, an investigation. As long as there is no, you know, as long as people don't know that there was a secret army, you know, they will not ask for, for, for more details on this, uh, on this point of research. Uh, could you talk about Gladio in the, um, in the universities of Spain? In the, during the 60s? Yeah, they, there, is a, there, 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 there is a story that the, the gladiators were involved um, and, uh, in smashing some student movements. Um, that, you know, it is always a question, why do, you need, why do you need gladiators in a dictatorship? That is a question that always comes back. You know, Franco, he, he could suppress whatever he wanted. He didn't need secret armies. He had secret services and he had the police. And if you're a dictator, you don't actually need secret armies, but it seems, and that is just what I wanted to, uh, you know, put in the book, that right-wing extremists who were active in Italy or who were active in Greece or who were active in France later came to um, to Spain, oppressed the people there, continued in criminal activities, and some of them later went to Bolivia or Chile and continued criminal activities there. So it's more a network, an international network, that nobody dares to talk about. Can you talk more about this Italian fascist, the fascist that came after the Borghese coup uh, to Spain? Delle Chiaie, Stefano Delle Chiaie is Stefano Delle Chiaie is one of the Italian right-wing extremists. He was he was um, involved in, in, in operations in Italy and in Latin America and other countries of Europe. And he's one of these persons who knows a lot about the role of the secret services in these operations. And that's why he's never in front of, of, of trial. He never stands in front of, the, of a judge uh, because um, he would say, you know, if you accuse me and if you put me into jail, I'm going to talk about NATO and I'm going to talk about the CIA and I'm going to talk about MI6. And these secret services. They were all involved in these operations. So if you blame me, I blame you and we go down together. That's what he says. And uh, in Italy we had this Borghese coup, which um, was almost, you know, basically it was a, a coup d'etat, but people don't realize that in Italy during the Cold War we had many attempts to overthrow the government. And at that time in the 60s the socialists agreed to withdraw uh, from the government, and at later times they agreed, uh, that is the Aldo Moro affair, uh, not to include the communists in the executive power. So you always had a struggle in Italy um, f uh, on, on, the, on the strength of communists and socialists in the executive branch. 
that was an intense struggle and uh, the the coup that you mentioned uh, is one is one of a kind in 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 in, in this struggle power what does it mean quantum because they say that it's the name of the uh, gladio in 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 spain quantum red quantum it is it's, you know you for if you look at the state behind armies in all countries of western europe you see that um in Switzerland, it was called P26. Okay, in 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 Italy, it was called Gladio. That is, it was discovered in Italy for the first time, so everybody knows the world the word Gladio. In in Greece, we have the word red sheepskin. In 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 Spain, we have red quantum, a name which surfaced. In Germany, some say it was just called Stay Behind. So, really, what you have in in Denmark, we have the name Absalon, which surfaced. In, in, in Turkey, we had the name Count Guerrilla. So what you really see is that each country had a known history with its secret armies. They had different code names, and it's possible that you have different um, secret armies in each country. As that is possible. It's not, not to say that everything that happened in Spain was um, red quantum, and red quantum was controlled by NATO uh, at all times. The problem really is that NATO doesn't want to talk about it. We need a list from NATO which says who was the commanding general in each country for the secret armies. We need this. I mean, people, at least countries who are members of NATO, should have the right to know this. Switzerland, as you know, is not a member of NATO. Um, we are part of the Partnership for Peace, which is called, uh, which is a, is a group of countries which just wants to be friends with NATO and have uh, an exchange of information. They don't want to be uh, members of NATO uh, yet, and the Swiss population, they don't sure don't want to be uh, in, in NATO. But I try to get information from NATO. I send it to our um, ambassador um, um, uh, in Belgium, and he then handed all my questions to NATO, and NATO just refused to comment. And that is the real problem. You, you know, the, the, the sort of detailed questions that you ask about the name and the network in Spain, they are important. But they need, in order to be answered, they need the cooperation of NATO. And as long as NATO does not publish anything official on the secret armies where there existed, all the names of the people who were involved and the strategic purpose, also the weapons they had and the, the communication structures they have, we are reliant on the former generals who, who, you know, before they die, explain what they did in their lives. I mean, that's, that's the data I basically use. General uh, Serravalle explained. He was the uh, general who in Italy operated this, the Gladio network. He explained how these meetings worked in NATO. NATO never says anything. We just have some people who talk about it. And that's, that's important. And what kind of terrorist attacks uh, did they commit it, and is there any proof that links, the, links them to Gladio and NATO? Uh, for example, uh, in Montejurra, or the, um, the Atocha killing of uh, lawyers? And what links them to Stefano de Lecchiai and all these Italian fascists here in Spain? There are unfortunately no proofs. We don't have, you know, a letter from NATO to the uh, Spanish secret army which says carry out a terrorist attack, please. We don't have that. There is no such proof. NATO can always say we have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do have is we have right-wing extremists in Italy uh, who carried out terrorist attacks. For instance, in, in 1972 there was the terrorist attack in Peteano. And we have Vincenzo Vinciguerra who actually carried out this terrorist attack. It is interesting to know that the whole network of NATO secret armies was only discovered because this terrorist attack was investigated in more detail. The story for a long time was that the Piteano terrorist attack in Italy, Piteano is just a small village in northern Italy, that this um, attack had been carried out by the Brigate Rosse, which were the, the uh, left-wing terrorist group in Italy. Because after the attack, there had been a phone call, and, 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 and the, the, it was an anonymous phone call, and they said, we are the Brigade Ross, and we carried out the attack. Okay, fair enough. Everybody believed it, and the, the, the police put it out into, into public. And so um, uh, the Brigade Ross uh, were thought to be behind the attack. Later, an investigative journalist in Italy called Vincenzo uh, 
uh, no, Felice Casson, sorry, Felice Casson, uh, he, he is a judge, not an investigative journalist, and he investigated this terrorist attack. And he found out that it was completely wrong what they tell, that it was not the Brigata de Rosse, but it had been right-wing extremists. So to investigate a terrorist attack can take many, many years until you really find out who was behind it. The, the, the attack was in 72, and the investigation of that judge were in the 80s. And in 1990, that's 18 years later, that judge forced the Italian uh, uh, prime minister to publicly say that there's a secret army. Okay, if you if you look at this, then you then you understand how difficult it is to investigate acts of terrorism. But in this specific case, um, uh, Vincenzo Vinciguerra confirmed that he had carried out the terrorist attack. He confirmed that there is a NATO secret army, and the prime minister then had to confirm that there's a Gladio secret army uh, in Italy. But in Italy, we had a lot of debate about the secret armies. In Spain, we had next to no debate. So there's not much knowledge about the details about uh, terrorist attacks in, it, in, in Spain. And that is surprising be because Spain, with the ETA, has its own history of terrorism uh, and it therefore is sensitive to the question of terrorism. So I don't understand why they're so little interested in NATO secret armies. I want to ask you uh, also, uh, if uh, was Gladio also involved in actions of uh, infiltration in communist and anarchist groups? Uh, in in the countries that uh, of Europe, like the Red Brigades, for example, or um, and I don't know if you have information from Spain, but uh, just um, in Europe in, ge in general. The the question of infiltration is an important question, um, but we don't know for sure whether um, uh, the Gladio network was involved in infiltration operations. It is possible. We we don't have any specific information on that. We know that in Belgium in the 1980s, we had a series of terrorist attacks. They were called the Brabant massacres. That was just um, a very, very strange um, uh, chain of events where, where people um, you know, in, 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 in black overalls would walk into supermarkets and just shoot down people, shoppers. You know? um, they didn't take much money in the supermarkets. They just killed people who were there with their shopping uh, cars and, and they should just shoot them down. Men, women, children, everybody. It was terrible. And, and, and then the whole population in, in, in Belgium was shocked. They were totally shocked. And um, it seems that the Belgian secret army was involved in this. But when the Belgian um, Minister of Defense um, uh, at the time wanted to find out whether the secret army was involved with this, um, the military secret service refused to cooperate. They refused to hand out the names of the secret army. In the Belgian Senate, they made an investigation and said, okay, we need to know um, who was in these secret armies. We know that the secret armies existed. The Belgian Senate did a very good investigation. They found out that NATO had secret groups, the Allied Clandestine Committee and the Clandestine Planning Committee, and that in these groups, the different representatives of the secret armies met. Um, so there's a lot of knowledge which came out of Belgium, but they couldn't find out who was behind the Brabant massacres. And you must understand that in Belgium, these terrorist attacks, that was in the, in the 1980s, the Brabant massacres, that is something which shocked the population. People want to know what happened. It is very important. And it seems that maybe there were infiltration operations there, um, using other groups and, and pretending there was somebody else. But Still, there's a lot of work to be done. I can't give you a very clear cut answer on the question of infiltration. Thank you. And um, what about uh, Aginter, Press? Aginter Press in Lisbon? Mm. Uh, could you talk about that? What was Aginter Press? Well, Aginter Press, um, on the surface, you know, when it says press at the end, you, 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 you would think that is just a publishing house, you know, Cambridge University Press, okay, that everybody thinks what they do is they publish books. Um, maybe some newspapers or, or, or journals, but in fact, again, the press was something completely different. It was a front organization, a front organization we call a net, um, a name, or it can even be a little shop, which 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 pretends, you know, that that actually this is a press house, and in in the back of it, you have a network. Uh, which does something completely different. Agenda Press was closely linked to, to the secret armies in Portugal, and the secret armies in Portugal operated also in Spain and in the former uh, colonies of Portugal. So they operated in Africa. And 
And that is also something, you know, which is obviously a, a very special thing, because in Portugal you also had a dictatorship under Salazar, uh, and that made Portugal another specific case, like Spain. I mean, Spain and Portugal, and also Greece during the time when it was a dictatorship, they, um, they obviously are a, a specific case uh, for the secret armies. It's very interesting, this point, because in your book you link uh, Aginter, uh, Aginter Press to um, an arms factory in, uh, in a street of Madrid, Calle Pelayo, in the 1977. And that uh, factory, that, that flat, was rented, um, uh, from, was, re was rented by Mariano Sánchez Covisa. He was the chief of the Guerrilleros de Cristo Rey, that was a terrorist group that terrorized people in demonstrations, uh, and uh, students' demonstrations and, and so on. So I, I was very interested when I read that, I was very shocked uh, to see that link because uh, you say that Aginter Press was, a, was linked to the CIA in Lisbon and then when uh, the dictatorship finished in Portugal, they went to Madrid. And you know, it's, it's very, it's, I think it's a, a very important point for the investigation in Spain to follow that link? I mean, the, that, that was the idea of the book, you know, to give many researchers the possibility to start their research based on it. I'm not saying that every sentence in the book must be 100% correct. I'm saying I tried to take together the information that I found, and I hope that in Spain and in Portugal and in other countries, there are people who say, hey, wait a moment, I didn't know about this. This is something which needs to be investigated. And I do see that there are people out there who, who, who do this work, and I think that is important. When when you when you know to, when you take the, uh, your knowledge and add it to my knowledge, then that is how science works. You know, it's like we we have building blocks, and somebody knows this, and he de describes it, and somebody takes it and thinks about it, and says, "Oh, I have something else. I know this," and you know, you now mention something which I didn't know, and, and that's how knowledge is being built. That is that is the idea of science. That is the idea of research. The only problem is that this case of research, this sort of research, is very delicate because we talk about terrorism in Europe and we don't talk about terrorists, you know, Muslims or just people, you know, far away and, you know, they, they're all, we always think, you know, they, they are responsible for everything. We talk about our own terrorism in sense, you know, the CIA is, if they're linked to terrorism in Europe, that is a serious question that Europe has with, with, with the United States. But I know that, for instance, in Germany, it's very difficult to talk about this because the Germans want to be very good friends with the United States. And the United States are the biggest uh, economic power of the world, also the biggest military power, and everybody does business with them, so nobody wants a problem with their business. And therefore, it's very difficult to talk about CIA terrorism in Europe. I mean, even in, in, in Switzerland, it's... It's difficult to talk about it, but I think you know we we should be courageous, and we should we should say okay, we look at the data, and we don't jump to conclusions, but we look at all the data. We don't only look in one direction; we look at everything. Yes, uh, it's very shocking because uh, if you look at the newspapers of uh, those years, the public opinion must um, well not the public opinion, but um, in the newspaper you read that. Like uh, if these terrorist groups were uncontrolled fascist, that they were with no link with uh, with political power, with no link with NATO, with no link with anything, just um, people that want to to continue with the Franco regime or something like that, that they are uncontrolled people. You know, like when we read uh, nowadays that uh, a skinhead has uh, beaten someone in the street. You know, but you don't you don't link that with. Um, with any political power, because that would be very shocking. So I think that's what happened in, in, in what happened in Spain those years. But um, anyway, I'm going to continue with uh, another question. Um, do you know something about? I, mean, I can. Yes. Yes. I can. Co I can comment. Comment on this. It's true that we don't link political violence and terrorism with the government. We don't do that. I mean. Because we think we pay taxes to the government, okay? That is already hard. <laughs> okay, we pay taxes, and the government then looks that the schools are good, that the hospitals are good, that we have roads to drive on, etc. 
we can even you know have an army which defends us and there's security and we have the police which looks after security so we understand that the government in all cases helps to provide security now the terrorist is exactly the opposite he does not create security he creates instability he creates fear he creates chaos and we can't really think that the government to whom we pay taxes and, and who is for security has anything to do with the terrorist who creates insecurity and chaos and fear. But in Italy and in other countries, we find that in some specific cases, criminal elements of the government are linked to this strategy of tension. And that strategy is to create fear in the population, to shock people. But then in the end, you pay your taxes to government, which uses the money to finance terrorists. I mean, that is absolutely unacceptable. And could you talk about the work of these terrorist fascist groups in in Spain against ETA? Because you talk about Stefano de Lecchia. I, I, in your book, we can read that he was also there were, uh, doing uh, terrorist attacks. It is true that um, I've had some information on ETA in, in, uh, in my book, but really the, the research on ETA is much bigger than anything that I covered in my book. Yeah. Um, what is now, in, there, you know, people, there are historians in, in Spain and also journalists in Spain who know much more about ETA. Yeah. I mm. frankly don't know much more about it, don't know a lot about ETA. I have to say this quite frankly, I really specialized in NATO secret armies. And what is now interesting to see is that we need to have these people who know a lot about ETA um, to look at the data that is now new on the NATO secret armies and see when were they fighting, what was going on, how, how does, is there a new light that we have to shed on terrorism in, in Spain during the last 50 years or, or does it not change the picture? That, it's just the question that arises. But really, um, I would go with the questions concerning ETA. I would, I would go to people in Spain. They know much, much, much more. Yes, because uh, there's a, um, a secret soldier, um, very interesting to study. It's called Jean-Pierre Cherit. He was a member of the OAS. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, um, he's in the Montejura um, attacks in the 70s. Mm -hmm. He's, he's mm -hmm. seen in pictures like Stefano mm -hmm. de Lecchiai and some others. And then he was killed in the 80s because he was doing some work for the, for the Spanish state. And his uh, widow, she asked for the Spanish state for, um, for money because uh, she considered that her husband had died for doing a work. State work. State work. So it's very, very shocking. And, and that's uh, linked to the GAL. I don't know if you've heard about it. It was gr it. Grupos Antiterroristas de Liberación. It's no, I don't know. Liberation Antiterrorist Group. And mm. if you read your book, uh, what comes to mind is this must be something related, but uh, I know that there must be some uh, further studies and investigation on, on, on all this because I think your, your book may change some views about um, and put some context in all this violence. But uh, it's better that some some further studies uh, would be done. I so mean, that is really the, one of the main interests of my book. I want to open a new new way of looking at terrorism in the sense that we have at some times terrorism which is manipulated by state institutions and that we have in some cases a deliberate idea to spread fear, you know, if you have the idea to spread fear in a society, um, that can be very, very useful to manipulate the society. And today the topic of terrorism is very big. It's big news all the time. Um, and it is very rare that we can go into the details of the terrorist attacks because it's very difficult to find out who was behind it because a terrorist bomb basically destroys most of everything. Uh, and you just see people suffering and you don't, you don't, it's very hard to find what happened. And then if the state is behind it, then it is even more difficult to find out because it's the state who carries out the investigation what happened. And the state, as we saw in Italy, cannot accuse itself. It cannot be that, you know, uh, police officers of the state investigate a terrorist attack. 
And then, you know, they might be honest people. And at the end, they find out, oh, Jesus Christ, that's people employed by the state who carried out the attack. They cannot say that. They, they will lose their job right away. So the state cannot accuse itself. But um, researchers, historians, journalists, people who are interested in, in peaceful coexistence, they must, you know, they must research these questions more and more. And do you know uh, what happened in, in 1990 in Spain when Andreotti uh, talked about the existence of Gladio in Italy? There was a huge scandal in Europe. And um, uh, yes, you have mentioned that here in the parliament, um, yeah. Some some parliamentary uh, ask for information to to yeah. the president, to the Spanish president, and but it seems like n nobody saw nothing, knew nothing, um, nobody knew about the existence of Gladio even when we entered uh, in NATO in 1982. So how is this possible? Uh, they, nobody knows e anything. They are lying. What what was what's happening? When um, the secret army was discovered in Italy, that was a problematic thing, not only for, for, for people in Spain, but also for people in France and, and in Germany. You know, it was very embarrassing, uh, because normally you don't have a secret army in a democracy. That is the whole idea of a democracy. You have an army, but everybody knows who is in that army and where the weapons are, and it's public. You know, It's not something that nobody knows who's in the army and what they do. It's, it's, for a democracy, a very, very strange thing to have a secret army. The French, for instance, President uh, Mitterrand in 1990 said, you know, we don't have a secret army. And then the Italian Prime Minister, Giulio Andreotti, said, oh, let me check. In this last meeting of the Allied Clandestine Committee, that is that NATO group in which the secret armies met, the French were also there, not only the Italians. So you really have the Italians going down, taking a lot of criticism, and they said, well, the French did it as well. You know, don't attack us. And then the European Parliament said, we need a very thorough investigation into the secret armies, into the question of terrorism in Europe, into who paid this. And they protested towards NATO and said, how could you do this? These were parliamentarians of the European Parliament. And in Spain, you had a parliamentarian who was called Antonio Romero. Um, I think he was uh, from a left party. And he, he asked Defense Minister um, uh, Serra, he asked him, you know, what? What's actually going on? What, what's, what's happening in Spain? We also have this secret army. Can you tell us more about it? And then Defense Minister Serra said, well, I, I asked the, the military secret service that says it. And there, the director general was Alonso Manglano, if I pronounce it correctly, Alonso Manglano. And he just refused to comment. You know, he should have gone in front of parliament and answered the questions, but he didn't. So as you say, it ends up with nobody knows anything, nothing happened anyway, and forget about it as quickly as you can. I mean, that is really what happened in many countries. In Germany, um, uh, we have this situation that the uh, SPD, which is the central left party, said we want a very, very thorough investigation of this. This is like the Ku Klux Klan. That is a quote. That's what they said. This is an illegal right wing network engaged in criminal activities. We want to know what happened. Uh, and then people um, from the government, uh, from the government uh, CDU, um, the chancellor was Helmut Kohl at the, at the time, they informed the other party that during their time in office, during their time when the SPD had ruled Germany in the, in, the, in the 70s, they had also covered the secret. And if they now wanted to talk about it, then the other political party is going to say what their responsibility was. So everybody was scared to talk about it because everybody was involved. Let's talk about today. Does Gladio still is, exist? I think what is important to understand that manipulated terrorism still exists. We still probably have attacks of terrorism which we don't understand. We get a story and we believe the story, but you know, when we look at history, we find that many acts of terrorism need to be looked at in much more detail. And uh, I'm, you know, it can be that the Gladio still exists in some countries. I mean, in Turkey, we now have this Ergenekon affair 
which is a very big affair. Uh, it's about uh, the Turkish military, which planned to, to carry out terrorist attacks uh, in public places and then uh, to overthrow the Muslim government of, 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 of Turkey now in power. Now, the Muslim government now in power uh, said this is unacceptable and put the Turkish generals uh, into jail or in front of court, not into jail, but in front of court. And this is the Ergenekon affair, and it's very closely linked to the to the Turkish uh, uh, um, Gladio. So in some countries we still have the question of of of, of, of secret armies, mm, but generally on a worldwide perspective we really have the question of manipulated terrorism. Whether we are ready to investigate uh, manipulated terrorism, whether we think it's necessary to look at this. And what happened with the, all the arms? Uh, that were the de deposits of arms all around Europe? Well, the military said they uh, cleared the arms caches and took all the arms and uh, that the arms are now uh, not anymore in, in, in private hands of secret soldiers. That's what the military said. And what does the, um, uh, the shape said? The Supreme Headquar Head Headquarters Allied Powers in Europe? That is NATO's branch um, uh, in Brussels, the, the, the Supreme Headquarters Allied Power Europe, and they said, we don't comment on it. First they said, there's no secret army. On the second day, they had to correct and say, what we said yesterday is not true. Um, we now have to confirm um, that some things are true, but we can't tell you more because it's national security. And what they then did in secret is that they had all the ambassadors, the NATO ambassadors from every country. You know, every country has an ambassador to NATO. So Spain has an ambassador to NATO, Germany has an ambassador to NATO. And then the Supreme Headquarters Allied Power Europe had to inform these ambassadors uh, because some knew nothing about the secret armies. And then the American general, it's always an American general who, who, who is at the top of shape. You know, NATO is always controlled by Americans. And he informed uh, the ambassadors that there were secret armies but he said they were not linked to terrorism. They were just waiting for the Soviet invasion. So that is actually the storyline that we get. We say, because that is already proven that the secret armies existed and that they were linked to CIA, that they were linked to MI6. Um, that is all proven and that there were arms caches. That's all proven. So NATO confirmed these things, but they said there's no link to terrorism. And that thing is, is, is further research. That is, that is the, the, the really delicate and important point, um, because otherwise we just say, oh, if they say they, there was no link to research, then that must be true. But before they said there is no secret army, and that was not true. So it's, it's better to look uh, uh, more clearly at these things. And in your book, you have forgotten to talk about the dirty, the dirty war against anarchism, not just communist, but anarchist. Anarchism. Why? Uh, because, for example, in Italy, Giuseppe Pinelli was arrested and, and, and thrown from a window, accused for being the perpetrator of the Piazza Fontana bombings in 1969. Why? Why is it? Why uh, you ha you have not mentioned anarchism in your book? Just communism. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it basically the fight was uh, against everything on the left. I mean, uh, you would group anarchists to the left and you would, you know, in some cases also socialists were actually targeted. In, in Germany we have lists. In Germany in the 1950s part of the secret uh, German stay behind was discovered. It was called Bund Deutscher Jugend Technischer Dienst, BDJ. Um, um, uh, and, and at that time it was possible to find so-called lists, proscription lists, we call them. That's lists that had been set up by the secret German army. Uh, those were all former people from, from, from the Nazi troops, and they had set up lists of people they wanted to kill in case of an emergency. And there are many people from the socialists on these lists, and when they saw these lists, they were scared. They said, you know, it's 1952, that's just you know, seven years of the end of the Second World War, and we are already again in this mess. Why do we have right-wing extremists who, who, who want to kill other people and have their list? And what, what you said about 1969, the Piazza Fontana uh, arrest, that was very strange, because the, the Italian military uh, and the Italian Secret Service, at the beginning, very, very quickly said, that is the political left, anarchists, socialists, communists all the same anyway from the from the perspective of, of the 
of the Secret Service. And they, um, you know, arrested this one guy and he died uh, in, under very un unclear circumstances. And they sort of said, you know, he's guilty. And only later, again here, very important to notice, we need a lot of time to research a terrorist attack. Many years later, we find out that this terrorist attack in Piazza Fontana had been carried out by right-wing extremists. And do you fear for your life because you're publishing this kind of information that shows that how Gladio was has had been related to terrorism or No, no. I don't. I mean, no. you know, you can say that's naive, you should, but the main thing is in Switzerland we never had um, an academic who was killed because of his research. We never had it in the whole history of Switzerland. There was nobody killed ever here in Switzerland because of his research. Um, it's not the same in other countries. You know, if you do research in Colombia on the paramilitaries, yeah. you can die. If you do research in Russia on, on the war in Chechnya, you can die. And uh, in China, you, you know, you, if you do research on Tibet and these things, it can be dangerous. It is, it is certainly true that um, research can be dangerous, but um, I think that the risks I'm taking are calculable and uh, I think it's important to think about this uh, research because if we don't talk about um, the secret armies, if we don't talk about uh, manipulated terrorism, it is very, very difficult for, the, for people who are interested in peaceful coexistence to, to make any progress uh, um, because they they will always be um, paralyzed by fear. And that is the main point. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. saying that manipulated terrorism has the idea to create fear in a society. Okay, that is the idea. And uh, the people who, are, who die in a terrorist attack, they're not actually the target. They die, but the real target is the people who survive and see this. And who are then scared that they could die, and so they don't say anything, they don't do anything, and uh, you know, basically accept whatever um, uh, they are being presented with. You know, the government can say, we need to search your computers, and people would not accept it, but then after a ter terrorist attack, they say, okay, search my computer. Or they say, we have you know, to take you into jail for seven days that uh, you, you don't have even the, the, the right to have a lawyer, and, and that is because there's a big terrorist attack which happened. People, you know, normally would say, no, of course not, that's, that's illegal, you can't do that. But after a terrorist attack, they are scared, and then they sacrifice some of their liberties. And that is, is not a good idea. It is important to defend democratic rights all the time, because we've had, you know, too many examples in history of, of, of governments who, who, who actually abuse their power. I mentioned Chile with Pinochet, I mentioned Stalin in the Soviet Union, you, of course, in, in Spain, uh, and remember Franco, and uh, in other countries, you know, there's too much, too much abuse of power, too much violence, too much crime, too, mu too many lies. And people today communicate over the internet. They communicate uh, in many new ways, and this is gonna, this is gonna have an impact on how they look at things because they get more stories, not just one story which they read every day in the newspaper, but new stories. And which, which that will start a reflection process. Now, I'm just one person. There are a million people who work on this. I'm just one. I, I don't know if we have a little bit more of more time, just for a few questions a more. Bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Ten minutes. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, anyway, the information that uh, you have in your book is information from newspapers, from books. So it's not uh, it's not confidential or secret information. So. Uh, for that part, I don't think it's dangerous because all the information is there, but you, you just have to uh, read it, analyze it, and study it, and, and put it together. And put it yeah. together. And that's yeah. a, a lot of work that you did in this book, and I thank you for yeah. that. Um, but um, which documents uh, would you, li would you, um, you would have liked to read, and you have been denied the access to? I would have liked to read the documents of the Allied Clandestine Committee. I talked about this committee many times in this interview already. It is in NATO that secret unit linked to SHAPE where the representatives of the different stay behinds met. You know, they sometimes they meet in Brussels, sometimes they meet in Paris, you know, different places that they actually meet. But they always come together and talk about it. Now, we know for sure that the Allied Clandestine Committee existed. 
um, because the Belgian Senate, which presented the parliamentary investigation, confirmed that it existed. They had the access to, to, to these protocols and they had access to, to secret NATO documents. So we know it existed. We also have General Serravalle, who was the, the general in Italy who commanded the Gladio structures in the 1970s. And he also explains that he was in these ACC meetings and he, he talks about them. And we have General Inserilli, who was also an Italian general, who also commanded the Italian Gladio, who talks about the ACC. And the interesting thing about the, the secret ACC meetings is that you had the Spanish in there, you had the Germans in there, you had the French in there, you had the CIA in, in there. It's really, this is something outside of democratic checks and balances. No parliamentary knew about it, you know. It was just, it was hidden behind the wall and you couldn't see it. And now I'd like to sort of break this wall and, and access this, uh, the documents of the Allied Clandestine Committee, but I, I asked, you know, I didn't get the documents. The Swiss government, you know, they, um, they were asked whether the Swiss P26, which was the Swiss state behind, was part of the NATO network. Remember that Switzerland is a neutral country. We shouldn't be part of any NATO network, okay? That is a scandal in Switzerland if that, you know, is confirmed. Now, I think there were links to the NATO networks and uh, the Swiss government thinks, no, there were no links. We were neutral, neutral, neutral. That's just the story here. And I don't believe in that story. But anyway, in order to confirm that we were not in the NATO network but had our own independent secret army somehow, the Swiss defense minister said they had asked the Allied Clandestine Committee records whether the Swiss were ever in these meetings. You know, look at the original transcript. And I said, oh, the Swiss were never in these meetings. I don't know whether that's true or not. I never saw the original documents. And um, why do you think that when a person begins to be interested in, in Glady operation and the secret uh, armies and looks for information in the, in the internet, um, all he finds is websites that mix serious information with uh, aliens, UFOs, so a lot of bizarre information, you know, like mm, there's a lot of disinformation on all of this. And uh, in your opinion, what, what's the reason for this? <laughs> I mean, I don't know for sure, but I look at internet sites very critically. You know, some internet sites, really, they mix Gladio and then put aliens next to it. And I say, if I was the secret service, I would, I would set up an internet site like this. You know, I would take serious information, very well researched, put it on my homepage, if I was a secret service agent, and next to it, I would put um, aliens and I would, I would say the world is going to end tomorrow and I'm going to, you know, just just lunatic things, okay? And if you mix these two things, then you actually discredit the information that you, that you put there. Obviously, people don't think that this can be done, but we know, if we look at history, we know that the CIA paid newspapers in the 50s and in the 60s and in the 70s. They paid journalists, okay? Many thousand euros, okay? To publish stories that were in their, in their, in their perspective. So these were, that was paid journalists. It was not free and it was not independent, but it was manipulated. Now, well, that was in the old days when you only had newspapers. Now, for 15 years now, we've had the internet. I mean, I first was on the internet in 1997, so that's 13 years now. And, and these 13 years, it is very clear that also the secret services start to, to be aware that this is an important source of information. I'm not saying that every bizarre homepage is manipulated by the secret services. But I think some of them are. I mean, why would you, why would you actually do these, these strange homepages, which everybody walks away with the, with, the, with, the, with the feeling that it's just crap? And are you surprised uh, of the lack of democratic control of the secret services around the world? Yes. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm really surprised. I mean, we should, we should be more critical about this. I'm, I'm, I'm saying very clearly that some people who work in the secret services are honest people and do a good job. I don't want to say that everybody in the secret services is a criminal and carries out terrorist attacks on their way home before they, they kiss their kids goodbye and, and, and put them to bed. I mean, I'm not saying this. Some people in the secret services actually have the same training like I do. I am a doctor in history. 
Okay, I speak different languages and I like to read about the world. You know, many people in the CIA, I met some people in the CIA, actually have the same background. You know, they, they, they love history, they love politics, they love economics, they know about the world and, and, and so many people are good people. Okay, I want to put this very clearly. Also in the Spanish Secret Service, some people are very good and honest people. Also in the Swiss Secret Service, okay? But in some cases, the Secret Services have been involved in criminal operations. And that is not acceptable. And it's just a question of whether we want to know about this or not. But there's a lot of data. There's such a lot of data on this. Gladio is one example. I talked about Allende in Chile in 1973, it's another example. I talked about Arbenz in Guatemala in 1954. You know, there's many more examples when you see the secret services of the US, of Great Britain, of Chile, or of Spain, uh, or of Italy, were involved in criminal activities. And that is not acceptable. I mean, that's not something very extreme to say, it's just if you park your car in the wrong place, you, you get a ticket, okay? That's normal. That's how, it, that's how a system for, works. And the democracy must control its secret service. It's important. Uh, and when the secret service is deliberately allowed to carry out criminal activities, then that is not acceptable. Have you studied the Kosovo Liberation Army and with the links with the CIA? or, you, or Yeah. You know? I, I know something about the Kosovo Liberation Army. I mean, the interesting thing is that in March 1999, NATO bombs the Kosovo. Now, that was illegal because NATO did not have a mandate from the UN Security Council. And if you don't have a mandate from the UN Security Council, you're not allowed to bomb anybody. It is illegal. The argument put forward at the time was, well, Milosevic is a very evil man, and he maybe was. And secondly, he's killing um, the people in Kosovo, especially the Albanians. And, you know, some of this was true. But still, you don't have the right um, to bomb a country. Interestingly enough, the Kosovo Liberation Army was supported by um, the British and the Americans before the bombing. So you actually made the problem bigger. We have records from the Special Air Service, SAS. These are paramilitary uh, of the British. And from the Green Berets, these are special forces of the US, that they were in the area and they trained the KLA and made them stronger. Okay? By training the KLA and making them stronger, you later increase the problem from, for Milosevic because the KLA, together with, the, with other Albanians, uh, you know, started the fighting, intensified the fighting in Kosovo. And from the other side, you had the Serbs uh, uh, from, from the secret forces uh, and the official police forces and the military forces from Milosevic. And these just you know, engaged in heavy fighting. Still today, you know, they, they don't trust each other. One group is Muslim. The other group uh, is, is Orthodox Christians, that's the Serbs, and that's the, the Albanians. And I just look at the conflict, and, that's, and I see the Americans and the British, they at that time supported the Muslims and made them stronger. They increased the pro problem. And then they said, hey, there's a problem. And then they came with the NATO planes and bombed the Serbs as the Air Force of the Muslims. It's a strange thing, but it happened. And uh, we need more investigation into, into the Kosovo conflict because it seems that the problem was there, but it was intensified deliberately. And I just have just one more last question and <laughs> it's over. <laughs> and one more. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, regarding 9-11, uh, do you think it could be a false flag operation? It's a big question, you know. It, it's the last question, but it's a very big question. It's a very delicate question because 9-11 was presented by American President George Bush as a surprise attack. He said, Osama bin Laden is responsible. He told 19 Muslim terrorists, including Mohammed Atta, to attack the United States and Bush and Cheney were surprised. Okay, that's the official conspiracy theory. It's also a conspiracy theory because in this case, the kind of uh, 19 Muslims conspired to carry out the attack. Now, obviously, those uh, who have followed the events uh, know that there are news stories uh, which say, no, that's not the right story. This is the, called the surprise theory. 
It's not true. The second uh, story is completely different. And it says, Osama bin Laden attacked the United States, but Bush and Cheney, they're criminal. Okay? They saw the attack coming, and they sacrificed 3,000 people in order then to be able to carry out wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq to secure oil and gas reserves and to reduce civil liberties in the United States. That is a completely different story. And the third story says, no, it was not like that. That's also conspiracy theory. And it says, this terrorist attack had nothing to do with Osama bin Laden. These videos that we've seen from Osama bin Laden, they were fabricated, fake. The secret, uh, the attacks were carried out by groups in the United States, CIA, Pentagon, secret services, criminal elements within these structures. They carried out the, the, the terrorist attacks against the United States themselves and sacrificed 3,000 people. Now, it has to be said, that would be very extreme. You know, If a country like the United States attacks its own people, kills 3,000, says it's somebody else, and then starts these wars. And what we really have as historians is that we look at the credibility of the Bush government and we say, is it the case that they have ever lied to us? And the answer is yes. In the case of the attack of Iraq, the claim was made there are weapons of mass destruction. This was a lie. Colin Powell said it in the Security Council. You know, weapons of mass destruction. He was Foreign uh, Secretary um, at the time. And uh, it was a lie. So there's not a lot of trust in the Bush administration. There's not a lot of trust in Bush and Cheney at all. We know they lied to us in the Iraq war. They furthermore said that Al-Qaeda is somehow linked uh, to Saddam Hussein and that therefore Saddam Hussein has something to do with 9-11. Another lie. You know, it's complete nonsense. It's not true. And I say that is the reason, because they've lied so many times, that some people say, and 9-11 as well is a lie. You know, they lied to us there as well. And they point to the fact that we do have two twin towers which were hit by a plane and then the twin towers crash okay that's that's what everybody has seen but in the back we have a third building which is called world trade center number seven and it's not being hit by the plane and it crashes also on 9-11 so it's not two but it's three buildings which collapse on 9-11 when i first discussed this with american researchers a very good researcher is david ray griffin he's a professor who who knows a lot about 9-11 you know, I was surprised myself. I mean, most people had never heard of it, that there are three buildings which collapsed. And that means that, yes, we must research more also on 9-11. It, it is very difficult because that is very, very delicate. I mean, we must research more on Gladio. We must be researching more on Kosovo. And we must research more on 9-11. And the idea why we must actually uh, look at these things again is we must find out whether some of the violence that we are living in is manipulated, is politically manipulated. And if that is the case, it is not acceptable. And then we should say, we don't want this. Thank you very much, Daniele, for this long interview. <laughs> how, how long did we talk? It was a very long interview. Uh, yes, one hour and a half. A lot of things.